I'm Tom Cochran, and I'm a nuclear physicist and an expert in the process of manufacturing nuclear weapons. I'm the director of the nuclear program at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I've served on various boards throughout the years, including for the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I was asked in this case to analyze some of the practices at Rocky Flats. This is the Rocky Flats plant. It lies 16 miles northwest of Denver. The complex is approximately 400 acres with over 100 buildings. Building 771 began operations in 1953 as the main area where workers fashioned plutonium into nuclear bomb parts. Building 777 was another plutonium processing building. Several creeks, including North and South Walnut Creeks and Woman Creek, run through the plant grounds on their way to the Great Western Reservoir and Stanley Lake. Operated by Dow Chemical from 1953 until 1975 and by Rockwell International from 1975 until it was shut down in 1989, the plant was built to produce parts for nuclear bombs. The parts were made from plutonium, uranium, beryllium, and the plant used other hazardous materials. Although traces of plutonium occur naturally, it is to all practical purposes a man-made element and was first identified by Dr. Glenn Seaborg in 1940. Plutonium is a heavy, radioactive, toxic, metallic element. Most plutonium is so-called plutonium-239, which is one of two primary ingredients in nuclear weapons. Plutonium was not the only dangerous material handled at the plant. Rocky Flats use other radioactive and non-radioactive materials, for example, substances known as volatile organic compounds but plutonium is the most dangerous and the one we will focus on in looking at plant management performance. People who work with plutonium know the most important thing about it is how dangerous it is. Inhaling even a minute quantity of plutonium in the form of particulates, too small to see or feel, can cause cancer. So first and foremost, plutonium must be handled safely and managed very carefully. Plutonium is also dangerous because it's pyrophoric. That is, under certain conditions, it can burst into flames spontaneously. The smoke from such a fire contains toxic plutonium oxide particles. Plutonium is more likely to ignite when it's in the form of metallic dust or filings. In making the weapon parts, the plant operators generated a great deal of plutonium filings and scrap that needed to be recycled or disposed of safely. Safe disposal is especially important because plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,000 years. This means it takes 24,000 years for one half of the plutonium to be lost through radioactive decay. If plutonium from waste or a fire gets into the environment, it's not going away. Some of it could sink into the soil and some could be blown around by high winds, but it'll still be there and it'll affect people for thousands of years. Plutonium is very hazardous for another reason. If too much of it is brought together in one place, it can initiate a deadly nuclear chain reaction. The amount of plutonium it takes to cause an event is called a critical mass, and the resulting nuclear reaction is called a criticality event. Such an event could irradiate and kill people close by. Exactly how much plutonium causes a criticality event depends on the shape and density of the plutonium and what other materials are nearby. If it's in metallic form, as little as two cola cans of weapon-grade plutonium is enough to cause a criticality event. In water, it can take as little as one-tenth as much. Criticality is another reason why it's very important to control plutonium carefully, to be sure that too much plutonium doesn't accumulate in one place. The fact that it takes so little plutonium to cause a criticality event is one of the primary reasons it's used in nuclear weapons. A bomb can be made with less than 10 pounds of plutonium. It's very important to keep meticulous track of every bit of plutonium so one can be confident it hadn't fallen into the hands of terrorists or hostile foreign governments. If you were running a plant that worked with plutonium, even in 1953, you would have known all this. And because plutonium, when not handled properly, is such a huge threat to workers, 
to the surrounding communities and to national security, there would be important things to control. Fire safety, safe disposal of waste, criticality, and inventory accounting. The U.S. nuclear weapons program, including the Rocky Flats plant, was the highest priority project of the richest nation in the world. Dow and Rockwell had the resources to do the job right. Let's examine the performance of Rocky Flats management in each of these four key areas. There were tons of plutonium on site at Rocky Flats and tons passed through the plant every year. With that much plutonium around, a fire is a huge threat. A fire could cause a major release of plutonium into the surrounding area. Rocky Flats had many small plutonium fires every year. Any small fire can get out of control, and in 1957, one did. A huge fire erupted in Building 771, and it took over 13 hours to put it out. It was made worse by the fact that the building wasn't built to slow the spread of fire, and materials used in production areas were flammable, adding fuel to the fire and making it harder to put out. The 57 fire was a very serious incident. Documents show that fire experts studied it and told Rocky Flats management what needed to be done to improve fire safety. But Dow adopted only some of these suggestions, and some of those it did adopt, Dow undid later. Meanwhile, bomb production was increasing. More and more plutonium was used. The plant was even less safe now than it was in 1957. A partition put between two plutonium processing buildings to act as a fire break was removed, so the building was more vulnerable to fire. Another big problem had to do with the hundreds of glove boxes where employees worked with plutonium. Fire often broke out in these boxes and they contained heat sensors to alert operators to fires. In the late 60s, material was added to the glove boxes to better shield workers from radiation. The shielding made of a plastic called Benelex was placed on top of the heat sensors. This configuration prevented heat transfer to the sensors, making them nearly useless in detecting fire. It would be like putting your home smoke detector outside of your house. Unfortunately, the Benelex shielding was also highly flammable. In 1969, another big plutonium fire erupted, this time in the glove boxes in Building 776. It developed into the largest industrial fire the United States had ever experienced. Even though many fires previously had broken out in Building 776, only one person was on duty in this building at the time of the fire. The fire had already spread before it was discovered. A building loaded with plutonium and containing hundreds of tons of flammable material burned out of control. Several hours into the fire, firemen noticed that the roof was getting soft and began to water it down. Had the roof collapsed, containment would have been totally lost and plutonium contaminated smoke released to the environment. This would have been a disaster of major proportions. According to the AEC, only the heroic efforts of the firefighters limited this burning. In hearings before Congress, a senior AEC official reported that had the fire been a little bit bigger, hundreds of square miles could have been contaminated and the cleanup costs could have been astronomical. Some plutonium was, in fact, released from the building during the 1969 fire, although people would disagree in their estimates of just how much. Most people agree, though, with the Atomic Energy Commission's assessment that only the heroism of the firefighters prevented releases from reaching catastrophic proportions. We must give the plant managers an F in fire safety. The next area to examine is the plant management's handling of contaminated waste. The plant generated a